Hi guys, thanks for having me. Um, just a heads up, this presentation is very basic. It was developed for the neighbor islands, just going over the new Appendix C requirements. So if you are looking for something advanced, you can run out and catch another talk. Uh, I think you still have some time. I promise I won't be <laughs> offended. Uh, when Marlena had asked me to give this uh, presentation, I have to admit I was a little hesitant because I did feel like it was going to be a little too simplified. But she reminded me that, you know, we're always getting new people into our programs, so it's always good to have refreshers. And she's just absolutely right because every time I open Appendix C and read it, I learn something new too. So with that being said, let's get started so we can get you guys to lunch on time. Okay, so one thing that I do want to address right off the bat, because this is something that our inspectors have been encountering when doing inspections, and it has to do with your permit. So you know when you get the letter from DOH that says you are now covered under the general permit coverage and this is your file number? Well, that's not your permit. Your actual permit is an 80-page document that you have to download from our website. It details all of the minimum requirements that you need to comply with your permit. In addition, there's another 28-page document, which is our standard conditions that you must also comply with. So if you are at our website, you get to our home page on the right-hand column, you'll see MPDS General Permits. Click on that, you'll get to a list of all of our general permits. Appendix C is the term that we've given for discharges of stormwater authorized for construction activities. This is what you need to keep on your site. This is what you need to comply with. This uh, new Appendix C had went into effect earlier this year in February. So there are essentially 16 sections within Appendix C, but for the purposes of this presentation, I broke it out into four main categories. The first has to do with coverage under your permit. The second is your minimum requirements. Third has to do with planning and implementation. And last, of course, everyone's favorite is paperwork. So one major change with, from the old Appendix C to this new Appendix C um, has to do with your receiving water. So under the old Appendix C, you could only get a general permit coverage if your discharge went to a Class II inland or a Class A marine receiving water. Higher classified receiving waters would require you to get an individual permit. This is no longer the case. Under the new Appendix C, it doesn't matter which receiving water is classified, you can go ahead and get the general permit coverage. This is gonna be a lot easier for permittees for a few reasons. One, it's cheaper. We're looking at $500 versus $1,000 for your filing fee. And there's a faster turnaround. It's about um, 30 days for the general versus six months for an individual. And then for those who don't already know, a general permit or a construction permit is required for earth disturbances of one acre or more, or if it is a part of a total common plan of development. Examples of what a total common plan of development is say I was going to build a subdivision and I were going to do it in phases that each were under one acre, well, I would still have to get permit coverage because it's part of one development. Another example, and DOT is most familiar with this, are linear projects, so along the highways or um, the rail system is also a good example. Remember that this includes your staging area, so if you think that you're kind of on that, that trigger next to almost one acre, you might want to err on the side of caution, go ahead and get permit coverage, because otherwise if you go over that one acre and you don't have coverage, you risk being in daily violations, which could also make delays to your project as well. Our permits can be issued to either the owner or the operator. DOH's preference is that they be issued to the operator for construction, and this is because operators are on the site daily and they just have more control over daily operations. All permits are good for no more than five years, and this is to ensure that DOH has the opportunity to revise and update the permits. And then always remember that your permit only authorizes you to discharge storm water. All MPDS permits are for what you discharge, where you're discharging it, and how much you're gonna discharge. If any of that changes, it's gonna trigger you having to get a new permit. 
So if the total area that you disturbed is more than what you disclosed in your NOI, or if you've found that you have a new discharge location and ultimately a new receiving water, then you're gonna have to go in and submit a new notice of intent. Once you get a new notice of intent, you're gonna have to cancel your old permit because DOH's preference is to only have one permit for construction in effect at a single time. And this is just gonna be cleaner for everybody. The next category details what you need to do. As I've already mentioned, you must also comply with our standard conditions, which is Appendix A. If ever there's a conflict between Appendix C and Appendix A, the more stringent requirement applies. Section 5 details the minimum B and P requirements, which I will go over in a little more detail. And then Section 6 says that you cannot violate our basic water quality criteria. So there's no floating debris, scum, oil, grease, any of that stuff in your discharge. If there is, then there's going to be additional reporting requirements. So we recognize that there are really two main sources of pollution for construction sites, dirt being the most obvious and largest, and then secondly is materials. For dirt, you really want to control it at its source and treat it using erosion and sediment control measures. For materials, the idea behind that is you want to cover it so that it's not in contact with stormwater. You want to contain it so it doesn't discharge, and then you want to properly dispose up and clean up spills. Keep in mind that BMPs do not always have to be physical. It doesn't have to be something that you purchase and install. It can also be administrative, like establishing good habits. So for dirt, vegetation is really going to be your best friend. The less disturbance that you can have, the better. You want to minimize the amount of open areas you have by doing phasing, and then stabilize and vegetate right away. Make sure you have perimeter controls. If you are within 50 feet of a receiving water, we ask that you maintain a vegetated buffer. If maintaining a vegetated buffer is infeasible, like linear projects would have a hard time with this, um, we ask that you have double layers of sediment control within five feet apart. Um, for stockpiles, you wanna protect them from being a source of pollution. So cover the small ones, contain the big ones. You want to initiate stabilization of exposed portions if they're untouched for 14 days. Steep slopes are tricky. We all know that water flows downhill. Stabilize, vegetate right away, um, put in interceptors. Divert storm water from running onto your site, because once it's on your site, sorry, it's yours to deal with. You want to um, not rely on inlet protection devices as your only form of protection. They should only be considered as your last resort. Keep in mind that DOH is okay with you pulling your inlet protection devices if a storm is imminent and you are um, protecting the public from flooding. Just make sure you document it, notify us, make sure the um, storm drain system owners are okay with it as well. Do not track out onto the roadways. If you do, make sure that you clean up using dry cleanup methods. Never wash down. Roadways are very visible. Uh, if you've got a mess coming off of your site onto the roadway, it's a good indication of how messy your site is. If you have contaminated soil, from an MPDS standpoint, we really want you to just cover it so it's not in contact with stormwater, contain it so it doesn't discharge. Otherwise, you will be dealing with our hazard evaluation emergency response branch on how to do remediation and disposal. For materials, the idea behind that is basically to isolate and contain them, make sure they have cover or secondary containment that is sized appropriately. You want to clean up spills right away. It's a really good idea to have your spill kits stocked and stored nearby. It's never a good idea to have them locked away and only one guy has the key. Otherwise, that's just going to add to your spill response time. Make sure your concrete wastewater pits there are sized appropriately. Um, concrete, paint, stucco, plaster, fuel, oil, soaps, those are all prohibited discharges. 
So because there is a lot of stuff that you need to do, you also need to have a plan that's developed to say how you're going to do it. Your stormwater pollution prevention plan or your SWIP should be developed prior to submitting your notice of intent. It answers the who, what, where, when, why, and how of your construction site. It is a living document and it should be revised as necessary and it should be kept on site. It's not enough to just develop a SWIP, you must also implement it. Section 7 describes the minimum uh, requirements that your SWIP must contain. Your SWIP must also be certified and signed. When an inspector shows up, this is one of the many documents that we will ask for. If that's something you can't provide us, that's a red flag to us that it's not being implemented. You know, construction sites are very dynamic. They're always changing. So too should your SWIP. When we ask for your SWIP, we want to see a well-used SWIP. We don't care if it has coffee stains. We don't care if it's got handwriting marks or uh, folded pages. That's a well-used SWIP. We're concerned when we see a SWIP in a binder that comes off the shelf full of dust. Okay. So section nine is your inspections. Uh, and self-inspections are done to ensure that you are implementing your SWIP and that your BMPs are effective. So if you've been tuning me out this entire time, that's perfectly fine. But this is the part that you really, really want to pay attention to because this is where the change in the new Appendix C occurred. So because the DOH is super duper nice, we have given you the opportunity to decide which inspection schedule you want. So you can either do your inspections every seven calendar days or every 14 calendar days and within a representative storm event. Representative storm event for us is 0.25 inches or more. If you choose that option because rainfall is a trigger, you're required to either maintain a rain gauge on your site or you can use rainfall data from a nearby weather station. Now that doesn't mean your project's in Kaneohe and you're using data from Waianae. It's a little drastic, but you get what I mean. It has to be representative. So inspections are only need to be done during normal working hours. So don't think that it's the middle of the night you gotta run out and do an inspection. That's not necessary. Just make sure that you do your inspections the next day. Also, the DOH will never ever ask you to risk your safety or well-being to conduct an inspection. So we'll never say go and inspect that receiving water and there's been a flash flood. Just document it, say that it was unsafe, and then do it when it is safe to do so. Inspection reports also need to be signed and need to be kept on site. Okay, so the change is that you no longer have to inspect the receiving water unless you've discharged from your site. And then alternatively, if your discharge enters into an MS4 system prior to entering into the receiving water, then you only need to inspect it where it enters into the MS4. And then if your discharge commingles with off-site water prior to entering into the MS4, so say you share an MS4 with someone, you can inspect it where it exits your site so long as it's done at a representative location. When you see something wrong, you fix it. Section 10 establishes the timeframes of how quickly those corrections need to occur. Corrective actions are done to repair, modify, or replace a BMP, remedy a permit violation, or to properly dispose of spills. Your report must be signed by the certifying person or the duly authorized representative, and it should be kept on site. It does not need to be submitted to the Department of Health unless you've had a violation of the basic water quality criteria and then the more stringent requirement applies, which re require you to do reporting. So if you've had a polluted discharge from your site, you're required to report it. Failing to do so is an added violation. I have seen the number go up very high, very fast because of this, okay? If you don't report it, I guarantee you your nosy neighbor will. 
the public is educated, they are aware, they know what the expectations are, they all have iPhones, they will take pictures, they will report you, they will shame you on Instagram. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So um, you're required to immediately stop the pollution, notify the DOH, and then follow up with a five-day written report. We cannot do our job and, re and uh, protect the public if you guys don't do your job by informing us. So what really is the expectation? Well, it turns out that the most effective things are always the hardest to do, like minimizing your pollution risks by doing phasing, and managing storm water. But ultimately, if you want to avoid a fine, then just don't discharge. Easier said than done, right? Well, if you do discharge, just make sure that you're discharging only storm water. Make sure you have maintained proper documentation and then that you've implemented good BMPs. So because you guys all decided to stay, I'm gonna give you a tip on how to reduce your chance of getting inspected by the DOH. Believe it or not, the DOH does recons of construction sites, which basically means we map routes and we drive by. Um, we can do about an average of 35 sites in one day. So that's what we're looking for. We are looking for discharges or evidences of discharges. Do you have reeling? Do you have a trail of dirt going into your inlet? We're looking at your risk level. How large is your site? Is it a small site, a large site? Are you on a steep slope or are you on leveled ground? We wanna know the proximity to a water body. Is it flowing through your site, adjacent to your site, or is it over a mile away? We're looking at your BMPs. Do you even have BMPs? Are they working? Are they effective or do they need to be repaired? We're looking at the status of your site. Have you not yet started? Are you active? Are you emasculating? Are you vertical? Did you start and then your project got delayed? Or are you completed? If you're completed and you didn't submit your notice of cessation, expect to get a field citation and not a courtesy call. If you started but your project was delayed, you're still expected to do your inspections. Depending on how you rank in any of these categories will determine whether or not you get a formal inspection from the DOH. So basically, there's a lot that we can tell just from the perimeter, the outside of your site. And if your site just looks like a mess while we're driving by at 40 miles per hour, you can believe that you're going to get inspected. That's pretty much all I got. You guys got any questions?